Everybody and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. It is a week of normality. Well, it is. We're prepping for Dice Tower Con, which starts next week, and we'll be doing live feeds and things from Dice Tower Con. And many of you are coming, and that's exciting. Some of you might be sad, saying, "I wish I could come to Dice Tower Con," but you can. Maybe not to Dice Tower Con, but you can still come on the Dice Tower Cruise, which is happening early December this year. There's plenty of room. We'd love to have you. It will be one of the best gaming convention activities you've ever done in your life. So, hey, welcome to the Board Game Breakfast. Like I said, today I'll be doing a live Q&A at 1 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope to talk to you, some of you then. And uh, there's not a whole lot else to talk about, really. Uh, so let's get started with the news. Okay, so in the news, D.D. Jachi has announced another expansion for Bang Armed and Dangerous, which adds more rules and stuff. Actually, this is kind of intriguing to me, just that Bang has been around so long and is still getting expansions. There's not many games that have been around that long, still getting expansions. Carcassonne is the only other one I can think of. They also announced another deckscape that's their escape room type games. If you'll notice, I really enjoyed the first one. This one's called The Fate of London, which sounds very dramatic. Next year is the 25th anniversary of Magic the Gathering. So they have a lot of events. They're starting to announce those. Different events are coming, new sets, re-releases. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but it's going to be big, I'm sure. A new expansion for Potion Explosion, the fifth ingredient, has been announced. This game has really been popular. Uh, so I imagine that this expansion will be very ple you know, pleasing to people. Uh, there is a new uh, game that you may have heard of called Pandemic Legacy 2. Yeah, Pandemic Season 2, or Legacy, Pandemic Legacy Season 2. Uh, this one has now been officially announced. Everyone's been known it was coming. They talked about it before and all. They officially announced, they say, Fall 2000. Uh, 17 with a special preview at Gen Con. I don't know if that means they'll have some copies at Gen Con or not. We'll find out. They've also given a lot of other information about the world and the changes and how you don't need to play one to play two. And I didn't really read a lot of it because I want to kind of go into Pandemic Legacy Season 2 unspoiled. Uh, Legendary DXP is a fantasy version of the Marvel Legendary System or the other, they use the Legendary System in a lot of things from Upper Deck, but it's going to be on the mobile devices. You can sign up now to get involved in the early adaptation of it and the beta program. Uh, we'll see, this, there's been a lot of excitement on the internet about this. Yellow has announced Sentai Cats. Uh, these are a bunch of cats who are fighting uh, a giant mecha dog, uh, getting into their cat suits. They look like cats who are also Power Rangers, which I would find extremely odd, except my daughters watch a Korean show, which seems to have almost this exact same theme to it. Artwork, of course, is good as usual. IDW has announced that they have uh, the rights to the Legend of Korra. This is a TV series from Nickelodeon, so they'll be making a board game on that. There is a new expansion announced for Manchester Madness 2nd Edition, The Streets of Arkham. This is going to have new investigators, new stuff, and a new type of puzzle that you deal with as you go through. I'm always interested in seeing the new types of puzzles. Renegade has announced a version of Planet Defenders. Sam and Z really have enjoyed that game. Then a review of the original game from Taiwan. And then finally, Haba has announced a minimum advertised price policy. You can see Chaz has been talking about these over the last several episodes. And so has Asmodee. Asmodee last year put into a play kind of a really weird policy um, where they were selling different prices to online and off. I'm not sure exactly how much of that policy they backed up on but they are now saying you can't sell their products for less than 20% off. But they've also lifted the uh, stipulation on people selling online. Pretty much anyone sell online before they had only a few publishers. We'll see where this is going. It seems like a lot of publishers are moving to the uh, minimum advertised price. What's going to happen in the industry? Honestly, we're still going to have to wait and see. Will someone challenge us eventually? I imagine it's going to head that direction. But meanwhile, let's get to the Kickstarter news.
Happy breakfast, everybody. We've got some fun games to look at, but we also have a book project that I think fans of the Dice Tower will be especially interested in. So let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Heliox is a deck building game that plays in three modes, cooperative, competitive, and solo. Players have asynchronous starting decks, but they all provide the basic currencies you need to conquer events, build up your tech, and recruit operatives. Architects offer unique abilities, but using them will take them out of the game for a certain number of turns. And unlike many other deck builders, cards purchased from the market go to the top of your deck. The campaign also offers the Mercury Protocol expansion. This is a big boost to the original game as it adds a bunch of new cards, including two new card types, and it adds a pick up and deliver element to the game. If you already own Helionox, you can get the expansion for $39, but if you need the base game and expansion, that takes a pledge of $59. Coville the Dark Overlords is an area control and tableau building game in which you're fighting for control over the land. Each player's Dark Overlord will leverage a team of minions that provide special actions, but they exhaust themselves when they're used. You'll use your troops on the board to move, attack, and gain reinforcement minions, and the troops on the board can work in conjunction with the minions in your tableau. Relics provide boosts for everything from battle to troop count, and you gain gold for areas you control at the end of the game day. And you have to watch out for rebel troops that attack player troops when they reach critical mass. Thematically, Coville's vast lineup of characters may feel a bit familiar because they riff off of cartoons from the 80s. You can get a copy of Coville the Dark Overlords for $35 plus shipping. Triplock is an abstract game with an extensive story driving it. Taking place in the steampunky New London, Triplock can be played solo or 1v1. In competitive play, you choose a character and race to solve diagram cards using actions like peek, flip, swap, and disarm. Of course, your opponent is working against you, so you also have traps and countermeasures to slow them down. Solo mode has you take a team of four characters through a progressive challenge. Chip Theory Games is known for filling their games with custom dice, neoprene, and high-quality poker chips. A copy of Triplock takes a pledge of $22 plus shipping. Fantastica Rival Realms is a prequel puzzle game to Fantastica. It's also the board game that was included in the Kickstarter Gold project. Rival Realms is a two-player card game in which players are trying to complete quests by working to align these region cards in their tableau according to certain placement rules. But when you need to discard, you discard to your opponent's pile, and there are adventure tokens that add artifacts, creatures, and more. This is a light and quick game that can be had for a pledge of $15, or for $20 you also get the Far Frontier expansion which adds relic tokens that provide special extra actions. And last, but most definitely not least, Jeff Engelstein is celebrating the 10-year anniversary of his game tech series of segments on the Dice Tower podcast with a compilation book. Containing 70 essays pulled from his hundreds of episodes, the Game Tech book provides transcripts of Jeff's favorite segments covering a wide range of topics, including game theory, math, psychology, and history. But the book also features new illustrations and annotations that provide updated info. Game tech segments are wonderfully researched and always present game and math theory in a fascinating and relatable way. The Game Tech book is available in a digital or hardback edition, and Jeff is signing all those physical copies. Good luck with your wrist, Jeff. You can get the digital version for just $10, or you can go all the way up to getting both the digital and hardback for a pledge of $40, and that includes free worldwide shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Hey, Jazz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. And this time last week, I was knee deep in the Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio, hearing about and talking about many of the games that are coming up on the horizon this coming year. And the food. <laughs> you, you, you can't survive a convention like Origins without periodically recharging with some of the fantastic foods that are available in the area such as the convenience of the North Market, or the variety of local restaurants, or 
Even the comfort of a meatloaf encased in a deep-fried cheese sandwich from the local experimental eatery melts. I'll eat that for science! But even among all the games filling our days and grilled sandwiches filling our guts, one experience from this year's convention has stuck with me even more than the 40 cubic inches of deep fried cheese lodged within my digestive tract. On the last night at the convention, several of us gathered around a table for one final night sharing the new games that we discovered with one another. First to hit the table was a brand new prototype of a negotiation card driven game followed then by a trick-taking game that's been out for several months but has flown under many people's radars. But then, the streak of new and unknown was broken when someone mentioned that they had brought one of my favorite games of all time, the push-your-luck dice placement game Las Vegas. An enthusiastic, yeah, alright, rose up from the table when they mentioned it, as if someone had ordered a pepperoni pizza. And I gotta say, Easing in to this old favorite game of mine was a relaxing experience, especially after the hectic week of working the convention, and it was made all the better when someone actually did order a pepperoni pizza. The experience of playing that tried and true old game after a week of eating comfort foods got me thinking about the games we find ourselves coming back to again and again. Comfort food games. Uh, games that, you know, aren't necessarily even our favorites, but ones that we default to. For example, one of my comfort food games is Forbidden Island. I gravitate towards it, even over its slightly more involved cousin, Forbidden Desert. Its combination of challenge and accessibility makes it a comfort game to me, and keeps me coming back to it as my default family and gateway game. I always keep it available at gaming events and family get-togethers, and it's it's never let me down. It's, it's like my tabletop equivalent of a burger and fries. So, what's your favorite comfort food game? A game that, even though it may not be your favorite, you're still willing to play anytime. In the comments below, let me know either that or the name of a really good gastroenterologist. Especially one that's really good at dislodging a week's worth of grilled cheese. I may have overdone it on the melts. For science. What's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, first of all, we're going to be working on a lot of those videos that we put out. The live interviews we did at Origin, we're, we're going to be cutting those up by company. So if you're looking for Rio Grande, for example, you can go and find theirs. And over the next two weeks, we're going to see those being released. But have no fear, we're also going to be talking about a lot of games. Our Godfather from CMON, that, that review will be coming out this week. Uh, Spirit Island. I have a whole pile of smaller games that I'll be taking a look at. So there's a lot of different reviews that you'll be seeing throughout the week, not just from us, but from our contributors. We'll also be doing a top 10 list this week, the top 10 games that are rage-inducing. What games might those be? Is it Monopoly? You'll find out in that list that'll be coming out this week. And also, uh, we have a new Dice Tower audio show with special guests coming out on Tuesday. You can find that and all the other wonderful podcasts in the Dice Tower Network at DiceTowerNetwork.com. All right, let's move on. Hello everyone, my name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm gonna go over the mechanisms in String Railway. So String Railway is a two to five player game that's pretty quirky because you're trying to build routes by using strings. So you use these strings in between stations in order to score points. So let me show you a little bit about this game and also why I really like it. So here you have your whole play area, which is all bound by this loop string. At the edge of every corner, you'll have a starting location for every player. Also, every player is going to have four different short strings along with one long string. At the beginning of the game, someone is going to place a mountain. Then someone else is going to lay down the river. On your turn, there are three steps to follow. The first step is to draw a card from the stack. Every station card is gonna show you how many points you get along with how many routes can go through it and also if there's a special ability to go along with it. When I place a station, it cannot touch another string and it also cannot touch another station. The second step is to lay down some track. You grab some string and you connect one station of yours to another station 
And of course, you can go through plenty of other different stations as long as you meet their limits. The third thing you'll do is count up your points. However many stations you've connected with that particular route, you go ahead and add up any points. You also add up any penalties in case you cross any other strings or gain more points by crossing different stations as well. So one thing that I really like about String Railway is the fact that it's super quirky and unique. There's no other game like it. You're also using the string in order to build route between one location to another location. The cool thing is that you're only limited by the length of that string, and whatever you do in between is all up to you. You can use it in order to benefit you so you can gain as many points as possible, or you can use it in order to kind of block certain areas and kind of deter other players from entering those locations. The game is super fun, and I say that you should definitely give it a chance. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. The day has finally arrived. Do you remember a few months back we did that contest to give me a theme, an idea to retheme Splendor? Well, I have good news. I finally picked a winner and I finished the makeover. And I'm going to show you that makeover today. But the winner is Scott Weber or Weber or Weber. Anyway, Scott has won based on his idea. And I'm sending you a copy of this and the makeover that I made. But there's more good news. The good news is there's going to be four winners. So let me show you what I did this week. Scott's idea was to change the theme of Splendor to Pokemon. And I thought, what a great idea. Pokemon is very popular. So I changed all of the poker chips to... These are the Pokeballs that you would throw. Actually, this is the Master Ball, which is like the Wild. This is the Dusk Ball, the Great Ball, the Standard Pokeball, the Ultra Ball, and the Speed Ball. All 90 cards correspond to the original cards in Splendor. For example, this card would require seven rubies in Splendor. Here, it requires seven Pokeballs. And this is the same throughout all the cards for each of the three levels. So the first week winner is Scott Weber, and I will be sending you this game and the makeover you just saw to your address. But I need you to contact me, PM me, whatever, and give me your address so I can send this off to you before I leave for Dice Tower Con next week. So thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I will see you next time. Hi, welcome to Miniature World. I'm Rob Warren. Today we're going to be talking about a game that um, some people really like and some people really don't care for, um, and that's Dark Souls. Now, I'm not going to sit here and review the game itself because there's people that like it because it's hard and then there's people that don't like it because it is very, very challenging game. I'm here to talk about the miniatures, and these miniatures are really beautiful. I ha uh, had a chance to paint up an entire set, and I have to tell you, these are some of the best sculpts I've seen in quite some time. These are just absolutely beautiful. They were a fun, fun paint job. And uh, doing the research by going through the video game, I was able to, um, if you don't follow the video game, you're able to get some still images and try to develop it as close as you could to the actual thing. But as you can see, that you get some big, beautiful sculpts in here. I've got to give these uh, miniatures an 8 out of 10. I think they are just fantastic. Uh, as far as the game, well, that's for another time. Until next time. I'm Rob Warren. We'll see you soon. Dice games are really fun. I love chucking dice. Yeah, and dice games are a great way to introduce the idea of probability math to young kids. Proba what? Well, maybe you don't want to use the word probability right away, and we'll talk about that later, but it's a great way to help your kids to figure out what they need next. Also, dice will help you to teach them how to create sequence and maybe sets of numbers. And that's why today on Time to Learn, we're talking about Sagrada. 
In the game of Sagrada, we are all artists trying to build the most beautiful stained glass windows using colorful dice as our piece of glass. Sagrada is a really fun game. I love making colorful designs on the board with the dice, and I just love the creative design in general on these boards. It takes 10 turns to play the full game. Uh, it can be dragging a little bit, but not very much. It's a small complaint. I think the game overall is fairly quick. It doesn't take too long to play the game. I think it's great that you have to place the dice on the board in specific ways, and I also liked all the colored patterns. Sagrada is definitely a great game. Uh, it became one of the favorites in our family. We have played a couple dozen of games just this week, um, and right after the first game we could notice that she was trying to figure out, okay, which numbers I can get, which colors I can get, just by the, the dice that came out. Uh, I remember the situation, she said, okay, there's four dice that are yellow, one die that is blue, I um, may not get my color, so this is probability, which we'll talk about later on. <laughs> but I guess that's all for us today. See you around the table. Bye. Bye. It's time to learn. Time to learn. Welcome to the thrift store where two brothers with five whole dollars attempt to find the most interesting or strange board game from yesteryear and review it for you. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's summer, baby, and you know what that means. It's time to review Calorie, a game for all fun-loving, weight-conscious people. That applies to us. Let's get pumped. It's beef season. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so this is Calorie, a game in which we're going to try to get rid of our calories, which are down here. We have 2,000 calories to start. The first person to zero wins. Each of the spaces has a little thing that happens, and you're either going to lose or gain calories. In this case, I can touch my toes. Finally, I lose 300 calories. We have a few different spaces like Slim Hope and Fat Chance, which will be little events that will make you gain or lose calories. Fat Chance, diet pizza is better than no pizza. Lose 300 calories. When you come around to our Your Off space, we're going to get a Get Fit Pit card, which is going to be some sort of physical challenge. Jog in place for one minute. Again, the first person to zero wins. So that was Calorie. The idea behind it is solid. Yes. It ends up being Fat Monopoly. So rather than passing Go like you would in Monopoly, you pass the You're Off. And I wish someone took the idea of this game. If like you and your spouse are both trying to lose weight, or maybe you're trying to lose weight as a family. If it was a fun game based around doing athletic challenges, like you could go quell with it where it's all silly but you're actually going to get a little bit of a workout i will say i could stand to lose some weight i could that's we're, just we're being kind of slim down that's being real up. we're going to see if this game can actually inspire us and eat healthy exercise more in six months yeah. we're going to re-review calorie and we're going to see if this game really works this is our challenge the calorie yeah. challenge do check us out on social media and all these places below we want you guys to keep us on it and until next time We'll see you at the gym. See you there. Yeah. Some arguments on the internet last forever. Uh, I've been watching uh, board gaming online for a long time, and one of the earliest arguments that still goes on today is hidden versus trackable information. This was a big debate when it came to Acquire. Acquire, a game from Sid Saxon that came out in the 50s, in which players would be getting shares of different companies. And the question was, as you bought and sold these shares, were the number and quantity of the different types of shares you have, do you keep that hidden? Or does everyone know? Does the amount of money you have, is it hidden? Or does everybody know? Now, there are a lot of games where things like this are kept secret. However, in many games, and there's a whole lot I could list off the top of my head, from Acquire to Tigers and Euphrates to El Grande to different ones, where the amount of things, Small World's another one, where the amount of points or money or things that you get is hidden in the game. However, anybody with a good memory could easily track where all this information is. And that gives that person a big advantage. 
So the argument comes down to this. If we do that, we are giving an advantage to people who have a better memory. And then those people uh, get an advantage over everybody else when playing the game. So why not just play with it open? The people who are for hidden information say, first of all, we should be rewarded. We're not punished for other skills that we have, for our deduction skills, our logical skills. Why should we be punished for having a good memory skill? And besides, having open information really slows the game down. There definitely is some truth to this. If you played a game where all the information is open and it comes down to the final turns, somebody could sit there and go, okay, you have that many points, 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 you have that many red tokens, you have that many blue ones, and really slow down what they're going to do. If they don't know or just have a general idea, it's better. And hidden information works really good in a game where there's hidden things, where you get things you don't know. That way it kind of negates that memory thing. But I'm talking about a game in which, like Small World, you get a certain amount of points every turn and you keep those hidden, but one person could count up everyone's points. And I have met these people, they do exist. Wow, what do you do in these situations? For me, it all comes down to the game. If I think it's gonna slow the game down, then I don't care if it gives an advantage to people with good memories or hiding the information. If it doesn't slow the game down, Tigers and Euphrates is a game like this. I think you should play open because it, it, there's no reason not to. And it, I think that it makes the game more interesting when I know that I need to get more green cubes uh, because that's what I need more of and Bob has a ton of them so maybe I, should, maybe I can fight him and he won't put up as big of a fight. That sort of thing I find fascinating. But this is where I throw the ball into your court. In the comments, tell me some games and say, do you like to play these games with hidden information or would you rather play with it open? Do you think that having a good memory is a skill and should be utilized in a game and people who are not good at memorizing things, it's a perfectly fair thing to say you're just not as good at somebody else in particular games. Is that a reasonable assumption? Do you play with things open? Does it bother you that that might slow the game down? This debate's never gonna be solved. I met people on both sides of it. I'm somewhere in the middle, but I'm just curious what you think. Should it be hidden or open? Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games. Recently, I was having a conversation about solo gaming, and the question was asked whether I played fan-made variants of solo games or if I only played official uh, solo variants. And I responded that I do, uh, on occasion, play fan-made variants. I have played them in the past, but that I generally avoid them. Um, I think it's great that there are people out there that make their own solo variants and post them onto places like Board Game Geek. I think it's a wonderful way to uh, either express creativity or maybe find a way to play a game that doesn't have an official solo variant. And like I said, I've done that on occasion, but honestly, I really tend to avoid them. And it got me wondering why. Uh, why do I feel this need to have some kind of an official uh, variation coming from either the designer or somebody on the design or production team. Uh, I don't really know that I've got the answer for that. I just know that uh, for one reason or another, I tend to only gravitate towards uh, games that have some kind of an official variant out of the box. And uh, I know that there are people that have said that the official variants are sometimes not as good as the fan-made variants, and there may be a point to that. I haven't played enough to really say one way or the other. But I do think it's interesting, and I, I'd like to know uh, your opinion on it. If you are a solo gamer, uh, even on occasion, do you play fan-made variants? Do you make your own uh, solo variants? Uh, or are you, like me, uh, perhaps stubbornly sticking to the official variants? Let me know your thoughts in the uh, comments below. I'd be really interested to know what you think. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Welcome to the new Hammer of Judgment for the Dice Tower. This will be replacing the gavel that I currently use. In fact, I'll be uh, auctioning off that gavel at the Dice Tower Con in the Jack Bass Memorial Fund auction. But this here is from Dogmite Games. I really like this gavel. It can has these rare earth magnets in so you can put dice or Legos. That's just what I have laying around here right now. And they just snap together 
and then you can carry this to your, most people aren't gonna use this for a hammer of judgment, they're gonna use it to hold their dice to go to different uh, role-playing meetups, but for me, it's the new hammer of judgment. Will it be good or evil? Hi everyone. This week my son asked me why do we call the 21st of June the longest day? I had to look it up, but here it comes. First we have the Earth. The Earth is moving, turning on its axis, and we've got the Earth moving around the Sun. That alone does not cause seasons to change or have longest or shorter days, but the Earth is tilted. And the North Pole is not getting any sun at all at this moment. But now if the Earth is turning around the sun, now we've got the North Pole getting sun 24 hours a day. So the fact that the Earth is spinning on a tilted axe makes longer and shorter days. This week I wanted to play a game that's called Seasons, but I loaned it out to someone and I don't remember who it is. So instead I am playing a game that is all about summer and lovely art. This week I am playing NIMBY. In NIMBY, players are bees who try to be the best bee the queen has ever seen, the NIMBY. And they do this by collecting the nectar from the most valuable flowers. Around the board is a flower path constructed and players are preparing themselves to go into the meadow and get the first card that is available on that flower path. But most of the time the most valuable point card is not the first one out there. So you need to prepare and make sure you've got enough honey that you can jump over those less valuable cards and go to the best flowers out there. The game comes in a very tiny box, but the components, the artwork, the game itself is really not to be overlooked. Look at this adorable Queen Bee miniature. I know this is a very short overview of the game, but I really ask you to go and check it out. It's called NIMBY. Next week I've got a special segment that I'm really looking forward to. Something big is happening in the town where I live. If you are able to figure it out or guess, let me know in the comments which Loto Pelit game I will be playing next week and why. See you then. Bye. Hi there. My name is Niels from Cyril's Brettspiele and today I'm going to the beach. Sand castles, yai games. Let's take a look what my best and worst is for sand castles. My favorite part on sand castles is by far the theme. I mean, who not want to play on a beach and building a gigantic sand castle and having this competition? Great idea, fresh theme, I really like it. Um, the thing that I don't like on it is Simply the mechanic, I mean, building this sand castle with just three different types like a uh, rock, uh, paper, scissor, and then you have this attack tiles here to attack these. It's, oh wow, it's just a, another card game that doesn't really click for me. Uh, sorry, sand castles. Uh, I, I was really tempted to try it out because of the theme, but at the end of the day, it doesn't click for me. Thanks so much for joining me and the beach party with Sandcastles. See you next week. My name is Neil Sorrels Brettspiele. Bye bye guys. Hey everyone, we're at Origins 2017 and guess what? It's lunchtime! lunchtime. So you can hear my voice. It has been a crazy week. Gosh, I probably sound terrible. <laughs> it, I, I don't sound much better, and you somehow managed to wear the... I've dodged bird. the bullet. I still have my voice. <laughs> so we were really excited to work with CG, and the game that we decided to talk about is Codenames Duet. It's not coming out till Gen Con, but we thought, you know what, we got to talk about it because it was a lot of fun. So it's by CGE Games, and I totally pronounced it incorrectly. incorrectly. Vlada. Vlada. Vlada Schwatel. There you go, Schwatel. I have a hard time pronouncing the last name. And Scott Eaton. Correct. Yeah. So this is a two or more player game. It plays in about, I would say it plays about half an hour if it's your first game and then progress to 15 minutes and by CGE Games. I like this one. It gives you the Codenames experience if you've already played Codenames, but you can play it two players, which is great because often you can't get a group of people together to play the game. 
So the, basically the idea behind this game, unlike team versus team, you're actually working together. There are 15 agents, but you're only seeing nine on your side. So the trick is three of them are the same, the other six are different than your, your partner. And you're trying to find them together, usually in a certain number of turns, the standard is nine. So you have nine turns to get them. The other big thing is there are three assassins on each side and only one of them shares the same location on both sides. So you have to decide because sometimes your side might show an agent but the other side is an assassin. So you gotta depend on who's gonna be guessing that. Yeah, so I love the cooperative aspect. You're working together, but you have your boards are different. And then that kind of timer mechanism with the uh, bystanders and the tokens. Mm -hmm. So basically we have nine rounds, nine clues. After that, sudden death, you're just guessing. So you could just bam, hit an assassin or even a bystander and it's game over. So it's not just a two player game. You can also play it in teams, but the teams are playing cooperatively this time. So still a fun cooperative experience. <laughs> and if you want to make it even more difficult, oh my goodness, then you can use the campaign mode. And uh, you start off with the basic prog at 9-9, but you can move out to having less tiles and less guesses. So another way to increase the playability. So uh, definitely want to look for a Gen Con. Yeah, coming out of Gen Con. And uh, I think that's it for now. And we'll see you guys uh, back at our regular time next week. Bye. Bye. If you run a board game cafe, Recommending games to your customers is going to be one of the most important jobs that your game gurus, or whatever you choose to call them, have. One of the most common requests we get is, do you have any fun games? And odds are, you're going to hear that question a lot too. So, how do you address what is on the surface such a seemingly obvious question? Of course people want to play a fun game. No one goes out of their way to spend an evening playing a game that they think is boring. People entrust us with the task of making sure that they have a good time. And that's the secret to being a guru. If you can find out what emotions your customers are in the mood to feel, you're halfway to finding a game that's going to be fun for them. Do your customers want to feel clever? Maybe a trivia game like Timeline or Geek Out. Perhaps an abstract strategy game like Pentago, Quirkle, or Blockus is just the trick to make them feel smarter than their opponent. Do they long for the cathartic release of tension? Well, stacking games like Via Paletti, Rhino Hero, or Wonky, they build the tension and release it like no other games can. Do they like to laugh at themselves or each other? Well then, speed games like Spot It, Spot 5, Ghost Blitz, and Anomia will cause instant screw-ups that have your customers raffle mowing all over the place. Are your customers looking for a dose of fear or dread? Try some horror games like Dead of Winter, Last Night on Earth, Panic Station, or any of a number of Cthulhu and Lovecraft themed games. Perhaps fear is too strong a word, and what they're looking for instead is suspense. Try a high-stakes co-op game like Pandemic or XCOM, or maybe one of our One versus Many games like Letters from Whitechapel, Fury of Dracula, or Spectre Ops will fit the bill. When your customers just want to laugh at silly jokes, you can't go wrong with party games. Cards Against Humanity is, of course, our most popular, but other games like The Game of Things, Say Anything, Snake Oil, Fun Employed, or Joking Hazard will have the room filled with laughter in no time. If your customers are looking to blow off some steam and release a little anger, then suggest a game where alliances are made and broken, players lie and stab each other right in the back, right to their faces. Secret identity games like Secret Hitler, The Resistance, and Saboteur do this, but so will games like I'm the Boss and Coin Quest. When people are feeling nostalgic, classic Americana will get the job done. A quick round of Guess Who or The Game of Life will take your customers back to their childhoods faster than you can say do not pass go. Remember, it's not about what you find fun, it's about what the customer finds fun. So, figure out what emotions they want to feel and fun is just around the corner. So, should you design a board game? Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes. I mean, I had an idea for a board game. Nothing serious, just some bullet points in the back of my mind which is a dark and horrible place. You know, my first idea was maybe about stained glass windows. Dang it. You know, or maybe an idea about futuristic baseball. 
That would be cool. Dang it. I know, I've got it. How about redesigning a European city? That, that's actually too many games for me to move, for me to make the, what's essentially not a very good joke. One Google search will tell you if your idea is at least thematically original. But one Google search will also tell you what day you might die. Don't do it. But then again, I mean, I've got a lot of games about farming, so maybe a strictly original theme isn't even that important. So are original mechanics more important than an original theme in a game? Ugh. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure just aiming at originality would be the best place to start. So should I design a board game or should, more importantly, you design a board game? Yeah, 100%, absolutely, go for it. Why not? Will it be a good game? Ah. There's only one way to find out. Bye. Hey everybody, thanks so much for watching another board game breakfast. At least we were on time this week on Monday. So we'll have another one coming out, of course, next week. And of course, next week's Dice Tower Con. So very excited about that. Um, don't forget, at 1 p.m. today, I'll be doing a live Q&A. Uh, we have a lot of reviews. Uh, mostly today is just board game breakfast. We can reviews back, by the way, if you've been wondering... About that, we, we, we shut it down a few weeks just because of busyness and we weren't putting up a lot of reviews. But there is many reviews that are coming out this week. So Week in Review will be back. And that's pretty much it. So I'll see you guys back at the live Q&A later today. So until next time, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.